Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 1, Episode 21, titled No One Lives Forever. It originally premiered on March 29, 1985, and is directed by Jim Johnson, who we will see again in Out Where the Buses Don't Run, Trust Fund Pirates, and Honor Among Thieves. So this is at least a director that we will see again. The writer was Edward D. Lorenzo. This was his only episode that he wrote, and I think there's some feeling in our group that that might be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, maybe he will be as short-lived as Crockett and Gina's relationship. <laughs> I knew, I, I knew. You knew I was going to bring I it knew. up. You knew. <laughs> you knew. And you know start- what's worse? You knew all this time and you didn't <laughs> properly warn me. See, I knew for an entire week because I accidentally watched this episode last week. You're all a bunch um, of Judas's. <laughs> so I, I, I was anticipating Jenna feeling this way. So uh, I have adjusted my note appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> this is be a fun one. Okay? Before we get started, we're checking and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, I'm going to start off this week. And actually, I'm going to use this moment to talk about ways that you can find the show. We've recently expanded the show. So you know that our RSS feed has been available since the beginning. Just want to remind people that now you can find us on iTunes and Google Play. We are also on Stitcher. Now, so if you're if you use that app or you know someone that uses that app, it is available there. And we're posting stuff on YouTube now too. So you can find us in a multitude of ways. Just want to take a moment instead of talking about our personal lives, do a little a little plug for our own work. Yeah, absolutely. And that YouTube stuff is super cool. I mean, I find that most of the time when I'm building some of our some of our posts throughout the week i just stop and watch i really like that visual it's like (laughs) mesmerizing it reminds me of like old school when you would put on what is the like the media player oh yeah yeah (laughs) and it would do all the different visuals (laughs) you know what's funny is that from that's from our era right where you'd put on itunes and there'd be a visualizer that would play while the music and you just like zone out watching the the waves of the music and the visualizer which some of us may have been zoning out for different reasons watching that (laughs) (laughs) but that's like a generation gone now right because you just you listen to it on your phone you drop your phone in your pocket or you you're looking at twitter or something while you're listening to music so those visualizer days are gone but my son who's 10 who's good who's gonna be 10 now he loves that he would sit for an hour and just watch the visualizer he just loved to watch it and now doesn't your daughter also have something that she likes it's just the beginning of something but she can watch it over and over and over again oh yeah so my youngest the the infant the little tiny one when she's the most upset and you have to calm her down she's only 10 months old we put i made a custom video the opening credits to the 1990s Justice League cartoon. She loves it. Well, I love the fact that it's just the opening credits that she likes. She doesn't like the TV show. No. Or it's just the opening credits that she really likes. No, and unfortunately, her favorite part of the opening credits is Superman. Oh. <laughs> so enough with the bad news. Let's hurry up and get on to this show. I think we have a split in the group on what we think of this episode, but we have much to discuss. All right, so this is this is an interesting open. So in this opening, we meet these punks that are just like just joyriding around. And this aspect of the story, these thugs that are because we have two aspects in the story. We have these thugs that are just cruising around, causing problems, and then we have the love story between Crockett and Brenda. These thugs is the awkward part of this story, I think, because the Brenda one is interesting in its own right. But the way that we start out is really interesting. They're just joyriding around. They have like a shotgun, which becomes a device that's constantly used throughout the episode, and they're just messing with people and trapping one person sitting up on the back of the seat in a convertible they're drinking they point the gun at a truck who for some reason doesn't slow down he just continues to yell at them and then at the last second decides to dive off the road into the ocean but sadly his truck didn't explode when it hit the water yeah yeah maybe the explosive water is only in 
the Bahamas or something. This, this scene really made me think of like the like old school 50, 50s gangs. They used to all mm. wear the same leather jackets. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, especially the way they had the ultimate high written on the side of the car, mm-hmm. you know, and they're all kind of wearing leather jackets. Like I, they're just like those 50s gang punks, you know? Yeah, you know, and I would um, completely agree. I feel like it was it was overdone to the point that you would expect in like in a theater performance something that's like overly dramatic it's meant to be like really really overdone they everything that they did was like yeah and we're extreme <laughs> like it was <laughs> yeah, yeah like, like a mountain dew commercial in harold and kumar those right. guys that they have yeah. to constantly deal with <laughs> exactly uh-huh. <laughs> I do want to point out, though, that nothing that they're doing seems like anything out of the normal. It just seems like normal Florida behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so this scene ends where the, they decide to just stop at some random food truck. There's people out front. They decide they're just going to hold up the food truck. They go. They see like an exchange between two people sitting at a table. One person leaves a bag. They kind of put together like, oh, I bet you there's money inside of that bag. So they go over. They split up. They go over and sneak up and they hold them up at gunpoint. And immediately the person who they're stealing in the background is like, very stupid. And then there's not necessarily a tussle, but people just start running. And then the shoot, these thugs shoot and they kill both of the people that, that are there. And they take the bag. But from the very beginning, like the bag, the person they steal the bag from and the people at the food truck make it very clear. Like, this is not just a normal food truck. You have made a big mistake. Yeah, you know what? And this scene and the constant like, food truck and hot dog vendors throughout the uh, episode it made me really realize that my state of washington definitely has a lack of hot dog vendors and like food vendors just the west coast in general right i know how come we don't have more of that it just made me think i recently was doing a, a job on a museum up here and across the street from the museum is satellite college campus and in there a guy sets up a hot dog vendor and i was so so excited to see a a hot dog stand again that i ate there like four days in a row (laughs) (laughs) well after we see this exchange with them capturing the bag we go to the opening credits and when we come back from the opening credits we get straight to this brenda storyline brenda (laughs) (laughs) freaking brenda well brent this what we start off with is that the duo are parked in is it the ferrari are they parked in the ferrari and yeah they are and crockett's on the phone he's he's talking to what sounds like he's talking to brenda brenda (laughs) and tubbs is harassing crockett giving him a hard time he's laying it down hey it's been a crazy two weeks for you right nothing but boat trips out out in the keys and dinner fancy dinners and stuff like that he's really like giving crockett a hard time about being basically head over heels for this for for brenda you know in this episode i think tubbs is actually a little more jealous than even female crockett yes we're going back to female crockett at this point (laughs) he he comes on multiple times pretty hard at brenda and at sunny in in this scene he's really pushing like like why don't you hang out with me you know we'll put catnip and elvis's kibble again yeah. remember that <laughs> yeah he's just joking around he's like in the beginning he's just joking around right he's like remember thinking about fun was like when you wanted to put some catnip in elvis's kibble which mm-hmm. is, is funny on multiple layers because one catnip might be code for something else and <laughs> two they actually do feed elvis kibble so <laughs> Does anyone know, does catnip work on alligators? Um, <laughs> God, I, I just, hope so. Or crocodiles. crocodiles. I just imagine that, that Elvis is like Gary the Snail. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> from spongebob yes <laughs> so i expect him to just kind of like like maybe start meowing one of these days <laughs> that's a that's pretty accurate for how because he's a pretty he's a part of this storyline even though we don't see him yeah this, friend of this, him this later. episode yeah after tubs is done harassing which i have to say tubs wasn't there last week so it's, i'm happy to see tubs back he does help mm-hmm. complete the Sunny Crockett in the show. Oh, absolutely. Yes. But I will say yes. that I think it's a little unjust of Tubbs to be so like, oh, look at you. You're so in love and now you're gone. And what happened to us being bros and doing bro stuff, right? When it's like, okay, dude, but you just, you know, mysteriously took off with your lady for like two weeks. Yeah, you were gone too, promoting your, I mean, hanging out with Valerie. Right. In all those senior homes. Right. 
<laughs> Coming to a county fair near you. <laughs> well, the reason why they're at this site is they're going to meet with the B team who are investigating this car, the, the car that we saw in the opening with the thugs. They've ditched it near the water and they've inside they found shell casings, they found some booze, and they found comic books, which they bring up multiple times in this episode too, just to highlight that these thugs are like kids. They're not really Yes, and, and I start to have a problem with this the further the episode goes along, because they continually refer to them as kids. And we've got to get to these kids before they're brutally murdered by what we can assume are Cuban bankers or something. <laughs> well and this is the second time we've had an episode like this where it seems like they're kids. Right, because in the maze, it was that way too. Yeah, so so the whole time they're trying to catch uh, to to catch up to these kids to stop them because they're they're gonna get killed because they're messing with all of these big big dogs. But as we find throughout the episode, these kids aren't so much kids, and they can kind of handle themselves. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the last the last thing I wanted to cover in this scene because we've we've gone on for a long time in this opening, but you know from the opening and the opening credits and now this first scene is that Tubbs has also given Crockett about him being in love and Crockett calls it LWP or lust with potential which he kind of snickers as being a great line but I think I'm going to come back to that in the breakup with Brenda at the end and see who really was laying down the lust with potential so after we get this cleanup of or we get this introduction they're like now the vice team is investigating who these thugs are and who they're harassing now remember they did kill two people so it's not like they're just going around harassing people there's actually two other people dead in a robbery at a food truck but now we go to and the first time we're actually going to meet brenda we go over to brenda's place and brenda and sunny are having dinner and brenda lives in a very nice house they're having dinner out on the balcony and she's asking sunny about his divorce which obviously he doesn't want to talk about yeah and uh it caught me off guard a little bit because i was starting to wonder like why isn't he on, why aren't they on the boat you know surprised to see the condo life for for Crockett. And that definitely plays a part in the rest of the episode. Like how we get to the end is that this is a life that really isn't for him. But in, at this point, he's really enjoying it. And we go, we have a very short dinner straight to sex, but not the sex scene that I think Jenna was hoping for. No, <laughs> it wasn't. And before we get too far into this, ass. <laughs> can we talk about the horrible transitions in this episode? Oh, that yeah, the like, bright white flash to like the next a, yeah, like a weird heavenly fade in and out. Like I thought for a second that we were going to reach like midpoint to end of episode and find out that this was all some sort of coma dream. Yeah, that you're right. That's what it felt like. I was it trying was to put weird. my finger on what it's like. And it's, it's like coma or dream soap opera style trans transition. Right. So I thought that was really weird. But back to Brenda, <laughs> our friend <laughs> Brenda. <laughs> I don't I really thought that I would enjoy seeing like a, the romantic side of Crockett but this was frustrating I mean not just for the Crockett Gina thing but like they've only supposedly been going been going out or whatever their thing is for like two weeks and I feel like Brenda's asking a lot of really serious questions for two weeks in where it's like oh like we're we gonna get married what are future Crockett's what, what do the Crockett's look like and it's like uh all right so that's so that's <laughs> later on in the episode we can talk about that more but i couldn't help but notice that he didn't mention the other existing crockett child that <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> may I, want to be I will say this i will say this i did notice that when he's around brenda he drinks less than he does when he's around gina mm -hmm. maybe he has to be more intoxicated to spend the night with gina i don't know <laughs> i mean basically what you get out of this so is that he totally ghosts gina he clearly hasn't actually ended anything with Gina or sees that there's See, anything to I end have, with Gina. And instead I don't has just think gotten... there was anything to end with Gina. I think Gina was the booty call. But that's not how she's she the she 2 a.m. phone call. Right. Well, the rose toten lovey dovey Crockett does make it a little hard to tell. And basically, <laughs> Gina has seen him at best and worst and dealt with all of that and he has had her over to the boat a number of times and it's been all nighters it's not just like hit it in 2 a.m you know she, where the dock is okay so but she's still but she's still gonna be there at 2 a.m when brenda's <laughs> gone 
<laughs> well, we have a lot to talk about with Brenda. So the last thing I wanted to point out in this scene is that the next morning, we just get an introduction to Crockett living the high life. He's up late in the morning. He looks like hungover Crockett getting up in the morning. Brenda's already up and exercising, but you can see Crockett is letting this slide. Normally, he's all business all the time, right? But not with Brenda. He's sleeping in and getting lazy. We have a brief stopover at a parking lot where we see the thugs. They come back. They're out looking for a car to steal and they just bash in a window and haul ass out of the parking lot. There's The, the theme to this whole thing is that these thugs never really hide any of their intentions. They're just out doing stuff. So the next thing we do is we go to the precinct and Gina and Tubbs are they're kind of working together l- looking into the investigation on the thugs. Tubbs is talking about that it's clear that there that there's no intent that there's no um, planning they're just out doing stuff. They're causing problems. They're just doing random acts of violence. And Gina, Gina is mining tubs for information. She's asking how serious it is with Brenda. It ha- is, it, is this the one? She's really pushing hard on tubs and tubs does not want to talk about it so i mean like i get that she she's putting tubs in like a really awkward position he's not gonna out his friend it's his friend it's his partner he's of course gonna be like i don't want to get in the middle of any of this and gina doesn't really let up i don't think i don't think it paints gina in the best light it makes her look a little bit desperate and and sad but i don't know i think she's warranted to feel a little bit of the way she feels yeah you know, yeah this tubs is, is tubs is definitely uh doing the bros before hoes <laughs> he just doesn't want to clean up crockett's mess is it clearly crockett doesn't talk to you but this is a you and crockett issue and i don't really need to be like playing telephone between the two of you you're both adults and you can have the conversation one-on-one yeah. about what his intentions are with brenda and with you exactly and tubs has his own problems with crockett because of brenda too right zito does interrupt and tell him that they found the they found another stolen car just blocks from where they found the first one and they have record of these thugs hanging out at a hotel he needs some help to go write down the addresses of phone calls that were made from that hotel room we jump over to the morgan headquarters so sorry we like cocoon memory wipe over to <laughs> the morgan headquarters <laughs> and we get a real introduction to the other bad guy that is in this episode his name's morgan and he runs he's like a bookie but he also owns this food truck company and he's talking to one of like his muscle that work that work for him and he's the muscle is saying, like, it can't be the Lombards, it's not the Cubans, it might be the Dominicans, and Morgan's like, it can't be the Lombards or the Cubans. But whoever it is, because since it's not one of those two guys, wants you to find them, find out why they're doing this, and then kill them. Fun fact, the the guy that he's talking to is Giancarlo Esposito, who played on Breaking Bad as, like, a very, very vicious drug lord and, you know i read a little bit about him i have to say mm-hmm. and i hope it doesn't cost our show too much to the fans i've never watched a single episode of breaking bad so i was huh. surprised when i saw that there was someone from that show on this show but i have no point of reference and he's been on it a couple times like he's already been on it front he was in little prince and oh. then he comes back in this episode and he comes back again in the Dutch oven. <laughs> <laughs> Not only have I seen every episode of Breaking Bad, but I also watched every episode of the other series, Revolution, that he was in, mm. uh, which oh. only lasted two seasons before NBC canceled it. After we, find, after we see Morgan saying like, hey, I just want these guys dead. We go to the street. Tubbs and Crockett are out doing their job crockett he's having a he's doing his job but he's having a hard time focusing on what he's supposed to be doing tubs they're out hitting bars and clubs like i'm saying they're working that list of the phone numbers that that they found from the whole from, from that motel but while they're going there they see a payphone sunny stops and he's gonna go call brenda and we see this really cheesy like teenage conversation between him and brenda to let it slip that they that he talked to her just an hour ago so they're talking to each other once an hour no you hang up no you hang <laughs> up i'm gonna miss you more <laughs> and then he has the gall to call out the two kids making fun of him that are standing at the booth which let me tell you what sonny crockett they are justified you're ridiculous <laughs> go call your kid every hour how about that how about you learn how to be a good dad for once tubbs decides not to stick around he goes into the bar to go see what's going on and after a couple oh, like minutes, actually do his job <laughs> weird after a couple of minutes the thugs that we that we know they come running out just shooting their guns into the air they're hooting and hollering hopping their car duke boy style and just peel out and drive away sunny finally drops the receiver and goes out but that no one can get a shot on them because there's so many pedestrians around so they're not able to actually do anything so the thugs get away but 
Brenda hears everything and hears how violent Sonny's job is, which has bearing for the rest of the episode. And Sonny drops the ball. He should have been there with Tubbs, helping him watch the back door, helping him try and bring these guys down. But instead, he's too busy making kissy faces with Brenda at a payphone. Right. And we go back to the precinct and they're doing a drawing of the suspect. And Ca- Castillo comes over to talk to him. And Castillo asks what Crockett was doing while the- Tubbs was in there trying to do the bus. And Tubbs tries to cover for him, says he was covering the back door. But Sonny confesses, he says that he was on the phone. And you can see the look in Castillo's face like he knows it's not what he was do- what what you know he knows like why he was on the phone but he's kind of letting it slide but you know that he's paying attention oh yeah he's like getting ready to bear down to that Castillo stare <laughs> for sure which, which we get a great one in this episode it's so good we also get a, a fan favorite coming up in the next scene yes. Hawkins Izzy shoes Moreno. yeah uh-huh. Richard Gere's shoes <laughs> <laughs> Before we get there, we have one stop over over at Brenda's, and this is where we have that awkward scene where they're laying on pool floaties and talking to each other in the pool. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I blacked uh, that. That's out. I was starting to uh, I was starting to get tired of all the all the different pool scenes because I mean <laughs> there's there was a few of them leading us up to here. This the only ha- thing that happens in this scene is that Sonny's just kind of lamenting that he messed up, and we get that Brenda just doesn't understand. We go back to the precinct, and Sonny's looking through a book of suspects. And this is when we get a fantastic Gina scene. So Sonny's looking through this book and Gina comes up very friendly. She, she pulls himself off the desk. She sits on the side of the desk and she comes to talk to him to find out. Tell Sonny like, hey, I ran into an old friend. You want to come with me this weekend? We can go see him. And Sonny at first is like, oh, yeah, I remember him. And then as soon as she says we should go see him, he's like, oh, I got something to do. And Gina lays the bitch slap on Sonny. Yeah, so because call- he's being a spineless punk, just messing around with her heart and then expecting her to not give a crap. Yeah, she's, she's she's straight up booty call. She straight up says that she's tired of being treated as a quote occasional pit stop. Good for her. Before the scene ends, she tells Sonny to get out of her life. That she, she she's tired of him taking advantage of her and I my note says here, Jenna will have lots to say. Yeah, the manipulative jerk. God, oh, you know, like this. The thing is, is that the episode's fine. Like the episode is a perfectly fine, good episode. But Crockett's such a douche. Like it just ruins it. It's just a freaking fart bag walking through it, and I just can't. I can't stand it. I can't. I can't stand how much of an asshole he is, and it ruins everything. And Brenda doesn't get any of it at all. She doesn't understand his life or the importance of anything. We get that later when she doesn't wake him up. So Brenda's awful. Gina's the greatest. I can't believe that they ruined it this early, and now I have to stick with this show for even longer. <laughs> I'm done. Speaking of Brenda and not understanding, the next thing we go to, we go back to Brenda. But it's another pool scene too. It's the, it looks like it's the same pool scene. We go back Brenda. Yes. And- Brenda's Many asking <laughs> and, and she's asking Sonny about Tubbs. She's basically trying to see who else in his life is important so she can try and undermine them so that she can prove that she's more important than yeah. anyone else in his life. But you know what? Like this is I think that this is a really good and telling moment that at this point I've been building up thinking like Crockett's a good guy. Like there are a lot of times where where you want to believe like Crockett sees the best in people. He wants to do the best in his job and for the people that he cares about. But have you noticed that he doesn't like when people get too close? Like he starts to push Gina, I mean, uh, Brenda away when she's asking too many questions about their future and too many questions about his life and why he like his past and things like that. Like he doesn't want her to be a part of that. And Gina very much understands a lot of that. And so he keeps her at a distance, right? Like she only gets so close and now he's doing the same thing with Brenda. It, It belittles Crockett to me a bit. That he, mm-hmm. that he can't have any kind of like real emotional intimacy. I feel like they were hoping to get for that, but I got to be honest, like I don't think that they got there. If anything, it seems oh, to Oh, but he actually starts to get there with Brenda. I mean, it's to the point where in a couple scenes, he almost, he starts talking about dropping the case to Tubbs. She's, I'm just saying. But every He's moment, never dropped a case for, for Gina. But every moment, because with Gina, it's real, okay? With Gina, it's him being his real self with her. He's not that way with Brenda at all. Like, he's not who he really is with Brenda. He's living this, like, vacation life where they only go out and do the fun things. They don't actually have moments of, like, 
where he's he's real and sharing real concerns and parts from his life. Like you get little tiny tidbits of that, but he very quickly eschews it away by making out with Brenda. And to build on that, that's where we get to this to this Dexy because then Tubbs, because this is affecting Tubbs too, and he calls out Sonny as well on this. We go da- down to the street and we find our one of the show's favorites. We find Mr. Izzy Moreno trying to sell some leather shoes to people on the street. Some authentic, genuine Italian leather shoes. Yeah, they yes, have worn just a- by Richard Greer in uh, what does he say? Pretty Woman or what? Well, no, I can't remember I what he movie quotes, he says. says that, yeah, yeah, he says he, a movie, but it's Richard Gear. I know that. Yeah, he says that Richard Gere won, but all he has left is size eight and a half. And the man he's talking to says like he wears 11, and Izzy says, quote, perfect, because Italian leather will mold like putty, like vacuum form to your foot. (laughs) Uh (laughs) And then he also drops that he's got some wooden clogs for sale, too. Which we see later on (laughs) in, like, one of the funniest scenes that we've had so far. The duo, they come walking up from behind Izzy. They grab him and pull him into an al- in- into the alley. And Izzy already knows what they want. He's like, yeah, you hear about these 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 thugs, right, that are shooting people and, and bre- breaking places up. You can tell from the beginning Izzy is afraid of these men. He doesn't want anything to do with them. But, of course, the Vice team taking advantage of Izzy and Nookie when, when, when he's an episode. They tell him, basically, they don't care. We're willing to put your life on the line. See if you can find out where these guys are. And on the walk back to the car, Tubbs is telling Crockett. And I like Tubbs' style here because he doesn't beat around the bush. He just tells Crockett. He's like, take a few days off because Tubbs doesn't, he says, he doesn't want to be killed because Sonny's head isn't in the game and he's not concentrating on the job go take a few days off go spend it with brenda come back focus on the job because if you're here i feel like i'm in danger you need to go get your head right and yet again tubbs proves that he's actually the most competent cop him and trudy are like the two most competent cops on the fleet absolutely which bears a question it's like how bad would it be if gina and crockett were a thing how how disorganized would those two crews be (laughs) I mean, neither of them can really focus, right? Right. So now we get our first montage of the show. We get a nice sailing montage. So Sonny takes up Tubbs on his offer. He takes Brenda out, which is already, we know this isn't Sonny's style. Sonny would have said, no, I'm good. I'm not going to go out on this yachting. But instead, he, he takes the time off. So we get a montage of them out all day long out on the water. That night, Brenda finally admits that she doesn't like so, s- s- Crockett's job, too. So question... What do they do with Elvis on these sex cruises? She mentions later that he was with them. Yeah, I think they actually he goes with them. Yeah, that's an interesting three way happening on Sunny's yacht. <laughs> I mean, yeah. for anyone, <laughs> for, anyone that, be... for anyone that owns a pet and has had <laughs> had <laughs> relations <laughs> with a pet around, you know that it's a bit of a a bit of a risky scenario. <laughs> I, mean, I can imagine that the risk factor just like really increases. <laughs> I, I can feel his eyes watching me. <laughs> I mean, is he hissing? Well, at, and at the end of this day, Brenda goes like full on psychologist. She's like, why are you hiding your fears? I don't know how you uh, pretend like you find happiness in this kind of job. And then she goes straight to asking nag, him about nag, Gina. Nag. <laughs> yeah, she goes straight to asking about Gina. And G- and Crocus says he he does defend Gina. So she's a good friend. She's a good cop. We work together. And-, and he's remarkably open with her because she's like, well, have you had basically like, have you had sex with her? And he's like, yeah, sometimes. So mm-hmm. like, what are you going to do about it? There you go. <laughs> that's that is what we that's what we do. That's what we are. And then it begs the question of like, why isn't he that open with Gina? Like, hey, you know he what this is? He doesn't care. Right. <laughs> Crockett got uh, me real salty this week. <laughs> I think John is pandering to that. <laughs> I told you I adjusted my notes because I know exactly how you were going to feel. I, I guess can't believe good. that you both have known and you didn't warn me. After this conversation with Brenda and how how he is with the job and how and his relationship with Gina, we go over to a diner and this is where we have the thugs. They're inside of the diner and they're doing their 
weird stuff like blowing raspberries and smashing food together with our hands and stuff. I don't know. I don't know what the what the deal is with these guys. Well, when you say yeah, like that, see, it sounds weird. <laughs> see, not only not only do they look older than Crockett and Tubbs, but they're not all there in the head. So I don't know why they keep calling them kids at this point. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is. Like there is there's a scene where they're like taking food and mashing it together with their hands and stuff. I don't know what's going on. But Izzy comes yeah. up to talk to him and he's doing his job, right? He comes up and he starts giving his pitch about the Italian leather shoes. And Ricky, the main thug here that causes the most problems, he starts pouring like salsa verde, maybe? No, uh, I think it's relish. Mm, yeah. Yeah, he starts pouring it on Izzy's shoes and you can see how nervous Izzy is. He does not want to be doing anything near these guys and he says like i'm just gonna walk away and pretend like nothing happened he just walks back he walks away after he walks away he goes over to the phone he goes to call someone and in the meantime after he calls someone in comes the muscle from morgan they come over to talk to these thugs so what's weird to me is that they pull that shotgun out while izzy's talking to them and that's what makes izzy be like whoa okay you know what i'm just gonna go over there and like mind my own business but if you look in the background all of the diners look like they've not seen anything out of the ordinary like no one gets tense or w- reacts weirdly until shots go off so is that just a thing that people just like frequently pull out shotguns and threaten each other i wonder that too it, now, it looked like he's he has it like partially inside of a bag yeah well maybe i missed that so as the muscle comes up and they're telling them, you know, the M- M- Morgan's guys are telling them, like, you basically messed with the wrong people. Ricky pulls out that shotgun and starts shooting. And he takes down both of Morgan's guys right there inside of the diner. And then they run off. And Izzy thinks he's been shot. Although the shotgun hits a like a pile of ketchup bottles. Izzy is freaked out. Yeah. So when Crockett and Tubbs show up later to assess the scene and they're taking the bodies out and stuff, they Izzy tells them, you can't kill a man. They're already dead. Like, he knows these guys have no care in the world. He also says that he didn't call the duo. He called Morgan to let them know that he found the thugs because Morgan was going to pay him $1,000 for the information. And, of course, we know the Device team, they paid they paid Noogie and Izzy $50 total for the, or the B team did, $50 total a few weeks ago. Yeah, you and know, if you drive a Ferrari around, you should get you should pay your informants better. I don't know, like, what, what they expected, too, but we just find out from... Izzy, like, hey, you know, he's always looking out for number one. Even though he's kind of a petty crook, he knows he knows how to take care of himself. Oh, yeah. So we go to, when we leave the scene, we go back to Br- Brenda's house. And it's the next morning. Tubbs comes over to get Crockett. Crockett's still living his high life. He's still sleeping in. We know Tubbs. He's an up. He's he's an early riser. In fact, he's such an early riser. By 7 a.m., he's already out there scoping for the ladies. <laughs> um, <laughs> So he goes over to get Crockett. And he knocks on the door, Crockett opens, you know, he's still sleepy-eyed, no shirt. Tubbs telling him that Izzy wants to see him the next that morning, and Tubbs comes to stay for breakfast. So now we have a great scene between Brenda and Tubbs. So Sonny steps away to go finish getting ready. Dude, and- it's scathing. Oh, yeah. Oh, when yeah. He, he says, can you imagine a bunch of tired cops and their wives on the veranda? How many softball games and barbecues are you going to attend? Like, he just lays into her. Like, you basically, like, you don't get any of this life. You don't have any idea what you're actually signing on for. Like, this is a real thing, and it's not what this made-up lovey-dovey moment is in your head. You got to love Tubbs. I mean, like he said earlier, Dom, he's just so direct with it too you know yeah exactly like he doesn't hold any punches he goes straight at brenda like you don't understand this life and i'm on to you you're just looking for like a diamond in the rough kind of guy that makes you feel good you know like a boy toy almost that you don't have any plans to stay part of this life you're basically as you mentioned earlier too john like the jealousy factor from tubs like you're stealing him away you're stealing him into uh-huh. a way into a life that he doesn't want yeah basically and the life that she doesn't want like she's already trying to push him to go away from being a cop and i mean crockett you know he's he's kind of letting brenda pull him that way yeah exactly so when we leave from there we go over to the marina and this is where they're gonna meet with izzy and we have this great scene of izzy walking up wearing the clogs but they're they're really hurting his feet (laughs) it's so bad (laughs) he's walking like frankenstein's monster 
of yeah. this dock. <laughs> he keeps stopping and taking his feet out of the clogs too, but he's sticking with it. He's you know, he's 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 a businessman. You have to see him wearing the clogs in order to sell them. So he's he's a businessman. He's forcing his way through it. No way, man. Every girl that's made the wrong footwear choice and has to ha- has to had to live with it while you're out somewhere knows that pain. <laughs> or it's like, well, it's either this or no shoes and I'm not in a place where I can go no shoes. So <laughs> guess I'm just going to walk weirdly. And he gets on the car. But the way he gets on the car is so awkward. He like, <laughs> like half falls and just pulls himself up and half like ju- jumps up but keeps his legs straight it's just so <laughs> weird he's such a strange little man the only information we get out of him in this is that he knows that the thugs are going to hit another one of morgan's food trucks because they just have a vendetta against him now um so that's pretty much the only information that they're able to get out of Izzy's. So now we go back to Why do Brenda's. Why they keep picking on the hot dog vendors, man? They can't have too much money. I mean, what are they how much are they really getting out of there? 50 bucks? Think of how many hot dog vendors have played a part in the Miami Vice episodes that we've seen so far. Like there's no way that they're only hawking meat. Like they've got <laughs> they 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 are invested in a number of very shifty dealings. And I think that's what this is supposed to be is that the Morgan run he's a bookie and so that's where you go meet your bookie is at these food trucks uh, okay so sorry and we so don't let's go, get to uh we don't let, go back to brenda's to the, quite yet we go to no we go to a stakeout yes yes we go to a stakeout where Tubbs and crockett park directly in front of the main entrance <laughs> and it takes about 30 seconds for them to be for the thugs across the street to realize that they are cops. You know, you'd think they'd be better at this by now being vice cops. Yeah, they'd be there, like, right there. Like, all the guy had to do was walk across the street and get, get a good view of their of their faces. He didn't even have to do that. He could he knew exactly what they were just from, like, they were, they were like, 30 feet away. Yes, exactly. And what, what my, my favorite part of this scene is that in about four or five scenes, Tubbs is going to park in the exact same spot. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the the ending part of this scene is that Tubbs invites Crockett out to dinner. Crockett's like, no, nah, I'm going to meet with Brenda. and But he says he'll be back at 6 a.m. the next morning. Brought in, b- bushy-tailed. He'll be ready to work. No, he won't. But that's what he says. <laughs> So then we go hmm. back to Brenda's. This time, Brenda's doing that thing where she's asking him, like, so what do the future Crockett's look like? Like, if me and you were to it, get it, married. It's a Mad Lib. It, it's a Mad Lib. And I tried playing it. So the Crockett's live on Mars, have purple <laughs> children, <laughs> and vacation in the closet. <laughs> but that was mine. But what you guys this Mad Lib? <laughs> By the end of this game, of this Mad League game, after they decide they're going to have octopus children, they it turns it turns on Brenda. She she says like we should you know we'll vacation in Paris, and that's when Sunny starts to be like that's not me, that's not what I do. You know I'm a blue collar guy. I spend a lot of my time working. I don't do this travel international and hang out at country club kind of lifestyle that she wants to live. And she pushes on him too. So she's like like well who are, who are our friends going to be? They're going to be other cops. Cops, and she throws some serious inflection on other cops and he gets mad he's like that's it i'm going to bed yeah he says i don't like playing your game yeah yeah which... so we jump to we jump to probably the fastest ass whipping in the history of television <laughs> <laughs> i mean we Dude, all i had know to rewind it because it was like it was fight, like an right? instant it flashed <laughs> so i want you to point out tubs is parked in the exact same spot <laughs> That they were parked in the day before. So, except he is by himself. Yeah, because Sonny, who was supposed to be there at 6 a.m., did not wake up. No, and the thugs quickly discovered that the same car parked uh, in the same spot across the street was there, but there was only one of them. And so we see them walking toward there, then flash, and that's it. Next thing we know, we see Tubbs at Sonny's door bleeding out of his nose. And this is like, Sonny, you fucked up, man. You fucked up real bad. Because so, so, after he gets a crowbar to the face, we go to Brenda's. And Brenda's waking Sonny up, which he's living a high life. He doesn't know what he didn't wake up in time. And she's like, good morning. And he's like, what What time is it? She doesn't tell him. She's like, good morning. Like, how come you didn't tell me good morning? She's like, I thought you need, you would want to sleep in. You looked like you were really tired. Her, like, like, do you think she 
doesn't get it. She doesn't get the cop lifestyle of Sonny Crockett. I don't Crockett, think Brenda knows what it's like purpose. to have responsibility. No, this I don't is think just... Brenda knows what it's like to have a job. You know, it's like, oh, if you want to sleep in, you sleep in. Like, there's nothing so important that you can't blow off to hang out on the boat with me and Elvis, right? No. I mean, I think that this is just the final stand of bratty Brenda, right? Where she's just assuming that she can, that she takes precedent. And so if she feels like he deserves to sleep in more and her stance against his job. And like, if there's one thing that you don't do, you don't pit Crockett against his job. There's already been one woman who now lives in Georgia who tried to do that. <laughs> yeah, so, true. Well, and he, he wakes actually, up in a panic. I think, I think the straw that bro- broke the camel's back was uh, let uh, was Tubbs getting beat up. If 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 that didn't happen, I think he still tries to fight for Brenda. Mm, interesting. Maybe. Yeah, so like still at the at that up to this point, nothing has affected him personally yet. It's all like oh, it just it's made some people uncomfortable, but now it's actually hurt somebody because yeah he yeah, he gets up in a panic and runs downstairs like he's gonna leave as soon as he opens the door Tubbs is already there which who knows how long he's been standing there to make this point <laughs> 10 minutes an just hour? bleeding out of his nose <laughs> 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 not and running so- down one cheek <laughs> That's true, though. I mean, up to this point, he's been he's had a lot of people giving him flack, but he's been able to write it off as like, oh, they just don't understand. And they're just like, I don't know, they're being jealous or, or they're they don't they just don't get it. But at this point now, he's very literally face to face with the consequences of him being flippant. Exactly. And so by after we see that Tubbs has been beat up really bad, we go to the precinct and this is where we get a fantastic Castillo scene. Castillo and the entire vice team are all there meeting. They're, Castillo's telling them we're going to step up our surveillance on Morgan. Tubbs puts out there that what they should do is they should obviously go make a move on Morgan for beating up a police officer and confiscate one of his trucks and then use that truck, that food truck, as a sting operation against the thugs. Castillo because says... Because once again, Tubbs is the only real cop there. <laughs> true exactly because he comes up with the idea castillo says tubs you're gonna work with the b team on this and everyone leaves and no one says a word to crockett as he sits there stunned and castillo says you're gonna stay here and i have paperwork for you to fill out and you're not part of this investigation and then just gives him the castillo stare for an uncomfortable length of time see <laughs> And see, and this is why I say it takes, it took Tubbs getting beat up because we see brooding Crockett, who's very conflicted. And you, we, we get these painful couple montage scenes of, of Crockett just brooding around, like trying to, trying to talk himself into the fact that, you know, that he's got to break up with this chick. Yeah, because he definitely, that's the conclusion that he comes to here. We have a fantastic montage of him riding around in the boat in the, off of the coast and going back and forth between love scenes and fun scenes with Brenda, but then the Castillo stare in between and then the boat and then Castillo stare and then Brenda laughing and Castillo stare. Which, if you think about it, is like the ultimate form, right? I uh, because he's he at this point he's treating Crockett like the child that he's acting like, where he's not he's he's that parent that's been pushed to just disappointment. Like I don't I'm not even I don't have anything to say to you. I'm mm-hmm. just so disappointed. I'm speechless. I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> Which for Crockett especially, because we we know that Crockett has many sort of like male mentors that he looks up to and needs that validation from is like the final dagger for him. So now the sting is set up. The B team, the ladies of Castillo are working this food truck that they confiscated from Morgan. Tubbs is out there playing the saxophone. Uh, so question hold on. Mark? I thought the... I thought the breakup was before the bust. Well, they have it. This is we have we show them they're set up. They're ready for it. We go back to Brenda's and Sunny. Okay. Sunny stops Brenda. He's waiting out in front of her house before she leaves for work. He says, "We have to talk." And we have the most amicable breakup in the history of television. Tubbs is making me break up with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But he doesn't even really break up with her. Like, while they're talking, he says, yeah, like, we should pull it back. But then, by the end of their conversation, they're making out, and he tries to give her a key. And well, she she rejects it. She's like, ooh, no, like, you you keep that. I think, but I think that's supposed to be a key to her house. He's trying to give her back the key to her house. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, 
he she I, I i think there's a combination of things here like i don't think she fully understands but then but then i can't tell because brenda's kind of manipulative in this where it sounds like and this is where i get back to where crocus said in the very beginning he said he was he was it was an lwp a lust with potential i think that's what yeah brenda was the window sunny yeah very true very true you see gina was Crockett's booty call, and apparently, uh, so then Crockett would be Brenda's booty call. I, th- I really think, especially because she's the one with all the money. She has a nice house. She travels. You know, she travels the world, so on and so forth. Like it's not Sunny's way. She went out and found, you know, her little street boy toy. And then when he said he couldn't mm-hmm. focus on chocolate, she's like, "Whatever, go ahead, move along. That's fine." So you you see, there's there's a food chain there, <laughs> Jenna. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let's get back to Tubbs doing his best Chet Baker impression. <laughs> well, before then, I just want to mention this very, very strange scene where we go to the thugs and they're like, it's in their apartment or something. And one of them is saying that he's worried about, I guess it's their random crime sprees that eventually they're going to get arrested and go to jail. And again, the vice, the vice writers, and they say, quote, you know what happens to people when they go in jail. And then... They want the other one says that they're out of money and he smashes the radio with the crowbar and then they decide to hit the bookies again, which I guess means Morgan gonna go hit Morgan again and then they just start sh- shouting and chanting, "Let's get the bookies, let's get the bookies." And that and it's so scene. weird, yeah, just over mm-hmm. and over again. It was it's probably the strangest scene we've seen in Vice. So far. So that reminds me. So watching these crazy guys the whole time, it made me wonder, when did the Clockwork Orange come out? Uh, 1969, 1970, somewhere in there. But it does have, like, you... I get that connection for sure. Mm-hmm. Do yeah. you think, yeah, do you think that's what they were going for? I guess it could be a, like just letting them have a little bit of ultra violence, although they never get the, the old in, out, in, out going, so... You know what's weird for me is that they reminded it reminded me a little bit of the Bronx Warriors, <laughs> <laughs> where they're just like running around and causing mischief and looking weird. Yeah, I mean, can I we, could, can we I talk about s- those two movies in the same sentence? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, I guess, if Ricky's out with his droogies and they're just out looking for the ultra violence, I definitely see the connection, John. But I think these guys have some more mental problems than the droogies did mm, that's impressive <laughs> <laughs> so now we're on to the final scene this is the sting we go back to the food truck the ent- all the vice team minus crockett are there with tubs playing his saxophone he's actually not bad i was gonna make a joke about it but he actually was playing pretty good that's why i left it with the chet baker reference which it, it has to be that he's not actually playing it right he can't be no no, no i mean his really. music career tank now we see so the the thugs they see the car drive by they see another thug so cassio reyes everyone like hey get ready and this is a very strange ending fitting for vice they drive by and they're all in there then the car drives by again and two of them are out and those two that got out of the car they pop up from behind the food truck one of them comes up to tubs who's sitting at a table now meantime the device team has seen it they t- asked gina to go like go get all the civilians away from this food truck so one of them comes walking up sits down next to tub says give me the bag and tub starts moving really slowly to give him the bag and then that thug gets shot but shot from the direction of tubs so i don't know who shot him who shot that was it zito inside of the food truck no he shoots him through the bag oh. yeah tubs. he has a gun oh. in the bag tubs shoots him gotcha and yeah so cook- that's that then, was going to be my first point, is that Tubbs shoots him, and the shooting starts, and from the beginning to the end of the shooting, no one once says, stop, police, freeze. No, yeah, none of that happens. just shoots him through the bag, and then Ricky pops out from around the corner, and Tubbs shoots and kills him. And then the last duck comes and tries to run over Tubbs, and of course, at the last minute, Sonny comes and totally redeems himself. Both the Ferrari comes and corners the car, pops out. Shoots the last thug who screams in his last sentence, like, uh, nobody lives forever, and then Sonny shoots and kills him. Okay, so a couple couple things for me here was, one, the Benny Hill-style gag of the uh, him chasing him in yeah. the car, chasing Tubbs in the car. I was like, laughing. That's ridiculous. I was laughing out loud. They're chasing Tubbs through the park. <laughs> like, how slow is he driving that he can't catch up to Tubbs on foot in those white loafers? Come on. You, you see the car almost come to a stop a couple times, too, because he's like, 
like, oh, we're getting a little too close. <laughs> right. <laughs> and two, uh, how come they've been talking about how these guys are kids and they need to catch these kids? And then they instantly, like, they went into this knowing that they were going to murder them. Clearly. They execute him. Yeah. He pops out of the Ferrari. The kid stands up and says, nobody. He's like, stop. And the kid says, nobody lives forever. And then Sonny shoots, shoots him three times and he's dead. And then, but we have a great Fox and the Hound moment at the end of the episode where Tubbs comes over to him and, and they kind of put their arms around each other and say, best friends forever. Like, best friends forever. And they Don't leave arm in arm. Yes. <laughs> the oh, yeah. 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 In this house. <laughs> And that's and that's the end yeah. of the episode. We just it, and I think well when... as they're walking away, doesn't Crockett like ask Tubbs like, "What do you want to do? You want to go fishing or trolling?" Which I can only assume trolling means trolling for booty. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they just they just go back to it's a very it's the same ending that we had with the B team uh, at the end of Made for Each Other, where by the end of it they're like, hey, you know what, us as partners is more important than whatever got in between us before, and that's gonna end uh, our rundown on this episode. Let's uh, we have more music than normal than the last few weeks we've had, so let's hurry up and get over to the music and get get a rundown. Okay, yeah, we've got a few different songs this week. We've actually got four. Obviously, the first song is Bad to the Bone by George Thur- Thurgood. Being, uh, George Thurgood and the Destroyers. They played it consistently throughout the episode every time we saw the punks. Da-da-da-da-da. It was released in 1982 on the album of the same name, their fifth studio album. And the two main things I want to talk... Did you know that George Thurgood and the Destroyers' original band name was the Delaware Destroyers? I'm glad they gave that one up. And mm. they're actually... It recently added to the 50 most influential Delawareans. Um, <laughs> how, which how I want to know who one? the other who are the other 49. <laughs> <laughs> And the last thing, to tie everything together, obviously this was chosen because it was also covered by Alvin and the Chipmunks. (laughs) (laughs) Yes! We've been hoping and hoping that it would come back, and we're we're here. It's great. It's back. I needed that. The the second song in the episode is His New Love by Glenn Frey on his album All Nighter, Mm. which was released in 1984. Okay, We've already so, talked about this, Glenn Fry's episode. It's it's another song from that same album. So I, I will say before you, I know you're going to keep the, the Glenn Fry segment short because we talked so much about him, but I do want to reconcile something. We missed an opportunity to talk about Glenn Fry and the amazing year he, years he's had from 1984 to 1986 because he was in the episode. We had the standalone episode where Glenn Fry was a main character. He's had multiple songs inside of episodes. He also, as I talked about in the last episode of this week in vice he had a number two on the on the chart song that was a song from mm. beverly hills cop which he was on the soundtrack of so glenn fry had an amazing 1985 yeah and thank you for dom that because that is a lot more than i cared to talk about unlike <laughs> uh, unlike pmc just just to be clear so who who didn't didn't sell well <laughs> if you want some more information on glenn fry i talk about it in the episode of this week in vice so check your feed you get some more more glenn fry information so back to the music the third song in the episode is Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs on the album Green Onions, released in 1962. So, really quick, Booker T and the MGs are are an influential band that was uh, that influenced Southern Soul and Memphis Soul back in the 60s. Green Onions was their like big album, and it was all instrumental songs. Mm. So, uh, in 1992, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Believe it or not, this Green Onions album, being all instrumental, was actually covered by Jan Hammer. At least one song was. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, with whatever band he was performing with. I I, it was kind of hard because it was just like all their names all those northern european names yes yes <laughs> so he performed he performed one of their songs with a bunch of vikings <laughs> in the discotheque <laughs> yes so but uh, the one i want to talk about the the booker the the main thing i want to talk about with booker t and the mgs though is their drummer alan jackson jr who a lot of people actually say is like the greatest drummer that ever lived. 
But what I want to talk about was the fact that he was murdered in 1975. Ooh. Mm. Yeah, shortly after, and because of his murder, the band would get back together and do another tour in his honor. But let me let me see if I can just get gr- run through the details of his murder. So, here we go. Alan Jackson Jr. Um, was murdered by Vikings. <laughs> Please say it. <laughs> No, no, but this is going to get very convoluted, so I, <laughs> I, I this is going to be difficult enough for me to get in. Should we so, call Serial to unpack this, or, like, or is, is it doable? It's doable. So, Alan Jackson Jr. was supposed to get on a flight to Detroit, but he realized that Ali and Joe Frazier were fighting the Thriller in Manila fight, so he decided he was going to attend a showing of the fight and stay home and then just fly to Detroit later. So, he goes to the showing and goes home only to find intruders in his house. Now, his wife, Barbara Jackson, who he was estranged from at the time, and once shot him in the chest, even though he didn't press charges afterwards. Okay. Yes, was tied up in the house while the intruders forced Alan Jackson Jr. on his knees and then shot him five times in the back, killing him. Wow. So somehow, Barbara Jackson, his estranged wife, who he was divorcing at the time, would run out into the street, Screaming and hollering, the cops would come. They would not find anything in the house missing, and yet they would pursue the man believed to have pulled the trigger from Memphis, who they believed also robbed a bank in Florida. They would find him in Seattle in a year later in 1976, where he would be shot dead for unrela- uh, in an unrelated gun battle. Someone called Dateline. Dude. Someone get this American life on the phone. The man believed to have pulled the trigger turns out to be the boyfriend of the wife's friend, Denise. What? So, yes. Okay, you guys, (laughs) next time that we meet up, we need to get a cork board and some red string. All right. Seriously. Someone has to figure this out. It's hard enough. I'm the one that did the research and had to write this out. I I just imagine that you have like a mind map. (laughs) <laughs> yeah just if you didn't understand any of that please rewind and listen to how his estranged wife who once shot him in the head uh Whoa, in, in the minute, chest not the head yeah, okay, sorry, in that. the chest <laughs> that once shot him in the <laughs> chest <laughs> yes how her best friend's boyfriend broke into their house and killed her husband and then was killed in an unrelated gun battle a year later in Seattle. Wow, oh, yeah, t- and then there's we- the part about her best friend's boyfriend also robbing a bank in Florida. We got to a weird place. I wasn't prepared for that we were going to end on a 2020 episode. There's actually one more song in the episode, Heartbeat by Red 7, which is on their self-titled album, Red 7, uh, which, released in 1985. Which we were talking about in, the, in our... Uh, Warm up. We were talking about that the lead singer from Red Seven looks like the love child of Meatloaf and Sam Kinison. Yes. <laughs> so Red Seven is a short-lived rock band formed in 1984 in San Francisco. It's a side project of Mike Rutherford of Genesis. Mm. Phil <laughs> Collins strikes again. He finds a way into every episode. Exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> this song was used in, in this episode, but Michael Mann also used another song off of this same album in his movie Manhunter as well, because. Michael Mann must owe Phil Collins something. I don't know. <laughs> so the, the their second album didn't do so well, and they actually lost their record deal. And you would never hear from them again, ever. <laughs> so the end of their Wikipedia ends like a Where Are They Now episode, <laughs> where they are all scattered across the country, uh, and they are like music teachers and like guys that set up stuff at local county fairs. Like, none of them, they all do mu- mu- mundane jobs that involve music and sound equipment. Uh, well, well, that is the music in this episode. Before Jenna runs off to go buy some red yarn, let's get over to our final thoughts this episode so she's still got time to make it to Walmart tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I already put it in my Amazon <laughs> basket i'm just gonna prime it it'll get there tomorrow all right well i'll kick off with the final thoughts you know i i enjoyed this episode there was a couple i i like i mentioned earlier i enjoyed 
Tubbs was back. He completes that team. We had an episode where all of the Vice team made an appearance, even Trudy, even though she's the only one of all the Vice team members that didn't have a speaking part in this episode. It was a, nice to have them all in. We got a fantastic Castillo stare. The thugs, as we talked about throughout the episode, they were awkward. And I think that the they needed to have a Vice story as part of this, I definitely want to learn know more about Morgan and what that book he is up to and how he knows that he how he fits in the role with the Cubans and the Dominicans and the Lombards. I want to know more about where he falls in the Miami crime scene because the Vice team seemed to know a lot about him already too. So I enjoyed this episode. I enjoyed the aspects of Gina and Tubbs and, and calling out Crockett for how sloppy he was getting and that there was retribution against Crockett for how he was behaving that he eventually came back back around although in a very quick fashion at the very end of the episode so it was a lot of fun i'm super excited for lombard and evan as we go into the last two episodes of this season so i'll take this episode for what it is john what are your final thoughts on this episode so i was just really happy to have tubs back i have grown to really love tubs and i i, I really missed him in that last episode a little bit a uh, little backstory for our, our listeners is i accidentally watched this episode the last week thinking that it was last week's episode so i knew what we were getting into going into this well before you guys did and so that's why i was i took a few shots at jenna a little bit more <laughs> in this episode but i mean ultimately I, I i felt it was a solid episode i mean i'd give it b minus or so but i was just happy to have tubs back and to get back the whole vice dynamic and you know, get a little bit of Crockett making a fool of himself. I feel like Crockett's always supposed to be the cool guy, and for, for once in an episode, he... he He's the bad guy. He really messed up, and you really see the punishment that he gets out of that. Jenna, I saved you for last because I'm sure, based on your opinions on Gina and Crockett and Gina's storyline and what Crockett deserves as a woman in his life and the, that how much Gina deserves Crockett, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Um, well, I mean, I think I already went a little harpy on it earlier. So uh, I was disappointed. Like, I'm just disappointed. I want I've I have up to this point really liked Crockett and the moments that they give very Crockett forward episodes have consistently started to erode the things that I like <laughs> about Crockett. Um, I thought that this episode was horrible for him. Because it paints him in just a really, just a really crap light. Like, I don't see him as a good friend or as a good partner or as a competent cop that understands how to have a personal life and a professional life. Or I don't understand his taste in women or the way that he treats them. I thought it, it just showed and all around. And his shoes are ugly. I just, thought, I just thought it showed all around that it all of the negative things about Crockett when I know that he as a character has a lot of really good traits so I'm ready to get back to that. In terms of my closing remarks on this I'd like to just turn it to this week in uh, Stan and Larry and say that it seems like the couple's tense. They when they're going through the files and Zito is leaning over Switek reading over his shoulder because you know he wants to be close. They need they need time to be close with one another, and Switek doesn't appreciate it. Clearly, there's trouble in the home life, and he gives him some files and asks him to go, you know, sit down and read away from him. So I, I at this point, I'm just trying to keep up on their clearly turbulent relationship. <laughs> I, I'm really pulling for him. I hope I hope for the best. But, you know, things are new. And sometimes when, you, when you're when you ready to make that commitment, it can get scary in the first couple weeks. So I'm sure that <laughs> they'll make it through. <laughs> I, I smell some Just... Tumblr fan fiction a la Captain America Bucky these... on coming soon. <laughs> these, these are just they're just little small anthills in the mountain of their love. <laughs> <laughs> well on that that's this week's episode of go with the heat season one episode 21 we hope you enjoyed this episode we encourage you to 
tweet at us using the hashtag GWTH for Go With The Heat. We are coming up on the end of Season 1. We only have two episodes left of Season 1. And we would love to do a rundown on our favorite moments from Season 1. We would love to hear from you. What is your favorite episode from Season 1? Tweet at us and hashtag those GT Go With The Heat. (laughs) GWTH. Okay, we'll get there. (laughs) Someone should have written this out. (laughs) You can do GTWH or GWTH, we'll check them Just Google those. Vikings, you'll find us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so hashtag those GWTH. We would love to hear your feedback on what your favorite notes is, or you can email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Go to our website, goalwiththeheat.com, click on subscribe, you can find all the ways you can get, you can listen to the show, go to About Us, you can find all the ways that you can contact us. We are on virtually every social network out there. We would love to hear from you on what your favorite episode is from season one. That's going to do it for us this week. We'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals. See you next week.